Hey ladies and gentlemen, it's Steve here. Before we get started this week, I want to let you know that on BJJ Mental Models Premium, we just launched an awesome three-part series with four-time world champ Dominica Obelinite. It's about competition and the crushing emotional pressure that can go along with it. Critical listen for anyone who's a competitor or really anyone who works in a high-stress environment. Give it a shot, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. You can check it out and get a free trial. Give it a listen. If you don't like it, cancel with no risk. Again, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models episode 163. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today... We're going to tackle something that everyone out there has been asking me to do for a long time. We're going to talk about how to get in shape. We're going to talk about strength and conditioning and who better to talk to about that than Mr. Mark Harari. Mark, how are you doing? Hey, Steve, I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. How are you? I am doing excellent. As of this recording, it's two days from Christmas. My daughter is fully on the hype train at this moment. She is just losing her mind. Um, it's <laughs> adorable to watch. You know, when I was a kid, I loved Christmas, right? I is, You get so excited around the holidays. But the only thing better than being a kid at Christmas is being the parent and watching your kid just lose their mind with excitement. Like she's like a prisoner, you know, where they they write down on the wall, like how many days they've been in jail. She's like the opposite. She's keeping track of how many days till Christmas. And she's just obsessed with this. So I am. Um, I mean, obviously, it's been a, a, you know, a tricky few years with the pandemic and everything. But it's always nice to have a reason to celebrate. Oh, yeah. So we're hoping to just, you know, come up with some local family enjoyment here and give her something to, to party about with the, with mom and dad. But yeah, it's looking pretty cool. So very hyped. That's awesome. How old's your daughter? She is four years old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. She's a like prime holiday age where all of this stuff, it just, it resonates, right? Like it's, it's in her brain. <laughs> And are you ready to have a pony at your house? Are you excited about this? Um, a pony, you know, luckily <laughs> her needs are much more simple. So, okay. So here's what she said to me. I asked her, I said, honey, what do you want for Christmas? And she said, dad, I just want to be near my family. I love my family so much. I just want to be with you and mom and also some money. <laughs> <laughs> man playing the game at four years wow. old yeah i know i've trained her right i guess or i've trained her completely wrong i'm not sure but i guess we'll find out well if, if she starts asking for bitcoin then you know uh, she's, <laughs> yeah. maybe going a step too far yeah. <laughs> well mr mark though on that note how are you doing why don't you let me know and also why don't you tell the listeners a bit about yourself Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you. Get, you know, like you said, getting up close to Christmas and getting ready for a brand new year ahead, which means, you know, everybody's starting to put their resolutions and goals and intentions and everything like that that they're setting for the new year. So it's, it's been exciting. Been working on that with some of my clients and, uh, just it really starts with mindset for me more than anything else. I mean, everybody has ideas of what they want to do and where they want to go and, that's great. But for me, it's, like I said, it's about mindset and let's find what those intentions are. And then let's work on making a plan of action to make those intentions attainable. Right, right. And so, you know, I've been working a lot on that. And you know, it's, it's I, I just try to stay all positive with it and uh, do the same for my clients and, you know, keep moving forward. So I'm excited about getting into the new year and getting things started. Like you said, it's, it's been a rough last couple of years, especially in the fitness industry out here in Los Angeles. But, you know, we're doing the best we can with what we've got and, and we're moving forward. And that's, you know, it, it's all about making progress every single day. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I can tell my story here, which is how I actually got introduced to you and how you came onto my radar as an expert in this field. Everyone knows this is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu podcast. And so for the majority of my adult life, Brazilian jiu-jitsu has been the thing that I do to get exercise. I mean, I have never been one of those people that has enjoyed the process of exercise. And I think a lot of this honestly is psychological. I just had really negative experiences with gym class when I was a kid. And I think that just stuck with me. I mean, I've, I've always been jealous of those people who enjoy working out and getting the heart pumping and doing exercise because I always hated it. And again, which I think is psychological. And for me, it wasn't until I discovered Brazilian jiu-jitsu that I discovered a physical activity that I actually enjoyed doing. And so for me, that has been the staple 
of my exercise and how I kept myself in shape for most of my adult life. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. And I mean, if you know anything about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, basically you're trying to sit on top of someone and, you know, it's, it's a very close contact sport. If one of you has COVID, the other person will definitely get COVID. There's no question. So, Or, or, or a myriad of any other things that you might have. <laughs> yes, yes. So Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was like one of the first things that people realized, okay, maybe this is not a smart thing to train in the middle of the pandemic. So that was actually actually really rough for me because I don't have a lot of fallback activities that I like doing. And just due to my living circumstances, I mean, I don't have a ton of space to load up with gym equipment. I've also got a lot of little critters in my house. I got cats. I've got my kid, right? So I'm always terrified that if I'm like doing box jumps in the house, I'm going to step on a cat or kick my kid in the face or do something terrible. Cats and kids. (laughs) (laughs) Stay out of daddy. Stay out of daddy's way when he's in the zone, sweetie. But it's been very hard to find something that checks the box boxes for me that I like doing that integrates with my routine. And so the pandemic was very rough on me. And it wasn't until I discovered uh, Supernatural that I kind of found something else that hits that that same sweet spot that jujitsu does where for those who don't know i've been a big vr enthusiast for a while supernatural is a vr workout app and it's freaking amazing actually and i was as skeptical as anyone about how well this thing would work out and coach mark here you're one of the people behind that you're one of the content creators on supernatural which is how you came onto my radar and from there i started looking into your story and the people that you work with and The thing I like about your style is it feels to me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels to me like a big part of your strategy is giving people confidence and helping them get over that mental hurdle and making them feel like, yes, you can do that. That's that constant reinforcement has been an ongoing thread I've noticed in all of the recordings I've seen of you. But I'd be curious to know if if I'm on the right track here or if you, you disagree and maybe I'm kind of missing the point. No, you're a nail in the point. And look, number one, it means the world to me that that you hear that and you feel that because we all do it our own way. And when I say we all, I mean all of the coaches, whether it's through Supernatural or whether it's a personal trainer or a group instructor, we all train our own way. We have our, our the things that are important to us and that we want to impart to other people. And you nailed one of my big things right off the bat. Everybody's at their own level of fitness. Everybody's at their own physical level and also comfort level. And what we've got to decide as coaches, and we've got to figure out as coaches is what level are you at? What do you feel comfortable doing? And what is one little step above that that'll get you slightly out of your comfort zone so that you will start to make changes and you will start to push yourself, but that's not so far out of your comfort zone that you go, oh gosh, this isn't for me. That's what we don't want to do. So, so my goal is to challenge everybody and try to find out what is that next level for you? What are you willing to do? that you may not have known that you could do. The body is capable of so much more than the brain realizes. And really, when you think about it, the brain is really built for survival. The brain is built to protect us. So your brain is not going to go, okay, let's take it up 20 pounds today, or let's you know punch a little bit harder today. Your brain's going to do the opposite. Your brain's going to try to limit you. But your body is capable of more. And the only way to train your brain is to push yourself a little bit further. It's to kind of really get in that mindset of, okay, I am going to level it up just a little bit today. Yep. And if that feels good, then I can take it up a little bit tomorrow or next week or whatever it is. So yes, it's it's really trying to make people feel comfortable, accepted, to let them know that they're in a safe place and to just have fun. That's my other thing is I always tell my classes where I, when I'm teaching at the studio, I always tell them, your goal today is to walk out of here feeling better and stronger than when you walked in. And that's honestly my goal. All I'm looking for is 100% of what you have today. Mm -hmm. And not everybody's going to feel their 100%, like their personal best every single day. You're going to have days where you feel awesome and you can take over the world. But you're also going to have days where it's like, you know what? I just don't want to do it today. Okay. But I want 100% of what you do have that day. And that's still a win. That's a victory. So my goal is to pull that out of you and make you feel great for giving that. So how do you do that, I guess, is the question, because I can imagine that the hardest thing is getting people in the door because it is intimidating, especially if you're not in shape, right? I mean, if you're not in shape, the first time you go to a gym, you don't understand how everything is supposed to work. You're surrounded by people with rock hard abs, right? It's very easy to get the signal that this is not your your place. This is not where you belong. And I think that's such a a big part of why some people struggle with strength and conditioning, which is that they just don't 
see a like a cultural alignment with the things that they like. They don't go to the gym and think, wow, these people are just like me. And I think that can make it hard. But one of the things that you're really good at doing is giving people the confidence that, yes, you can step in and do this. And I, I'd love to know, how does how do you do that? Because I'm assuming that the first step is probably often the hardest. I'd love to know what that pitch looks like if you want to really fire someone up and get them to go out into that space that they've never been before. You brought up some really great points. And sometimes it's tougher than others. Honestly, for me, one of the biggest things is building relationships. I think that's it's relationship and trust. And once you start building that relationship with somebody and that trust, they're willing to try things that maybe they weren't willing to try before or just haven't tried before or didn't know they had the opportunity to try before. So getting somebody from the moment they walk in the door to start feeling like they are your friend and that they can trust you and that you are here for their best interest, that's difficult to do with some people. And it takes a little bit of extra effort. The other side of that is you don't have a whole lot of time. You know what I'm saying? When somebody comes in the door, if they don't like you right off the bat or they don't feel like they trust you right off the bat, you're never going to see them again. They're going to go you know, find someplace else or they're just not going to come back. They're not going to, they're, they're going to decide that, well, maybe fitness isn't for me. So going back to your question, how do you do it? It's really kind of reading the room and it's going to be different with every person that walks in the door. So my job is to not jump in and talk about fitness right away, not jump in and say, cool, how much do you bench, bro? It's it's (laughs) like, let's have a conversation about life. Let's have a conversation about, hey, how are you today? If they say, I'm crappy. Okay. Well, that's going to be a little bit tougher because they're already in a not great place. So now I got to change their mindset and get them to a place of positivity, get them to a place of yes, get them to a place of feeling like, okay. You know, I I like this guy. I can open up to him a little bit because without that, the door is shut. So again, it's it's kind of letting them talk, letting them talk about themselves, their comfort zone. Right. Um, and actually, I'm going to steer this around to you just a little bit. One of the things that you said that was so important is that you found Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to be your thing. That's what you found that you love and have a passion for. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I try to find with with clients, um, especially new ones, is I ask them, "What do you love to do?" And if they say, well, you know, I'd I'd like to do this, but I don't. Okay, well, that wasn't the question. What do you love to do? Do you love to play basketball? Do you love to swim? Do you love to jog or take a hike? Do you like lifting weights? Do you love boxing? What is it that you feel comfortable doing and that you could do every single day and be happy with? Now, if they come back and say, well, you know, I love gymnastics or I love, you know, basketball. Well, I don't have a basketball court and I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm a horrible basketball player, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I can do from there is think, okay, they like competitive sports. They like cardio. They like things that make them think they like team activities. How can I spin that into creating a comfortable and safe place for them here? Maybe it's not just lifting weights up and down and counting off numbers for them. They're going to be bored to tears. How can I make this a challenge for them? So I try to structure something for each client that's a little bit different and that appeals to who they are and also who they want to be. Because that's part of the reason why you're here is you're looking to make some changes. Now, that doesn't mean you're going out of your person and becoming somebody else. No, you have everything inside of you to get to that next level. So we're not changing you. We're just letting you know that we can take what's inside of you, the untapped potential that you have inside of you. If we can pull that out of you, you won't transform into another person. You'll transform into an even better version of you. And that's what we're going for. Right, right. Yeah. What it sounds like you're saying is that actually the, if I'm understanding correctly, it sounds like you're saying the most important part of being a a strength and conditioning coach is not actually the strength and conditioning coach side of things, but more the mindset side of things, because you kind of need to, like, it sounds like you kind of need to cook it a little bit first. You need to get the person into the right mindset and find a routine that they actually enjoy before you even start worrying about picking up the heavy thing and putting it back down again. Yep. 100%. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, there are a ton of fantastic coaches out there. There's a ton of very well-trained and experienced trainers out there that have a ton of you know letters and abbreviations after their name with all their certifications and all this other stuff. And that's great. Having that is, is nice and it's important. But what's even more important than that is how you communicate with people. Because I don't care what your background is and what your what your major is and what your certifications are. If you can't be relatable with somebody and you can't adapt your program to to fit with the person that's in front of you, then I don't really have much use for you. You may be able to write a great book and you know and put together an awesome workout program about how to train, 
but you got to be relatable and you got to be fun. you got to be fun quite honestly i want somebody that is experienced and has knowledge but can also put on a show and not in a big explosive annoying <laughs> annoying way yeah. obviously but, but you know there's a ton of of workout facilities especially here in los angeles i mean workout studios in la are like donut shops <laughs> or cleaners you go up and down ventura boulevard here or over in the city and there's a workout studio, a fitness studio on every single corner. And the truth is, they're all probably pretty good. So what what's going to have people come here instead of someplace else? It's going to be the relationship that you build with the person. It's going to be it's going to be that person that says, "Nope, I'm only going to work out with Mark because I like this about him, or he makes me feel like this, or right. I've seen progress here, or he gets me." So building that relationship to me is even more important than your education. Yeah, I I think that makes sense because it is the relationship that will ultimately hold you for the long term in this process, especially if it's a process that doesn't come naturally to you. The relationships are key. They're the thing that are going to bind you to the material. This is similar to jujitsu, where we always tell people like, look, one of the most important things you can do in jujitsu is find the right gym, find people who they train the way that you want to train. They teach the way that you want to learn. They're people that you like and, and that you enjoy spending time with, because if none of those things are true, if you hate the gym and you hate the people, you're simply not going to stick with it. And so the first thing to set the table, if you want to turn this into a long-term habit, and it has to be a long-term habit if you want to be successful at it, is you have to enjoy it. And that means making sure that you find the people that can help support you to get you where you need to go. It's so true. Surround yourself with people that are better than you, that are smarter than you, that people that you admire and that you want to aspire to be. And that's going to help you level up. One of the one of the quotes I heard a long time ago that I love, and I'm probably going to butcher it slightly, but I'll get the idea for you at least, <laughs> is... If you're the fastest runner in a race, you may win every single time. But if you're willing to run with people that are faster than you, you may not win every time, but you will personally run faster and work harder than you ever have before. And that is how you're going to level up. Yeah, it makes tons of sense. Now, something I'd like to explore here. Your coaching background is is very unique in that I know you work with a lot of celebrities. And I'm interested in the aspect of celebrity coaching. Now, I'm going to guess that the majority of listeners to the podcast are probably not celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you never know. You never know. But that said, there are certain concerns that I think someone who is a professional like that is going to have that are probably relatable to the majority of people, right? I mean, if you are a celebrity and there's a lot of, in the jiu-jitsu world, there's a lot of famous people who train jiu-jitsu. Yep. All you have to do is Google like BJJ celebrities and you'll find whole Wikipedia pages of BJJ people who are famous because jiu-jitsu people love to advertise this stuff. It's a very popular pastime. But of course, the thing is, If you are an actor, for example, you have to protect yourself. You have to take care of yourself. Yes, the training might be helpful because it might be required knowledge that you need if you're doing if you're doing your own stunts or maybe it's just a way that you like to stay in shape. But things like injuries become totally different if you have possibly hundreds of people who are banking on you being healthy enough to show up to work. I mean, famous example in in the space that I'm aware of is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He wanted to return to professional wrestling. He did that. He got injured. And because of that, they basically had to scrap a whole movie he was working on for about a year. They had to push the whole thing back. And that's because he got injured doing this thing that he loves doing. And as a result, there were a whole bunch of other people who got penalized for that. So the the lesson here is celebrities usually have a lot of constraints around their training, right? They can't just go and, you know, they can't just go and go ham and not worry about getting injury. They have to be very, very careful. And even though most people are not Hollywood celebrities, I would argue that most people do have similar constraints, right? Most people don't want to show up to work tomorrow with a black eye or a broken arm. And so those realistic considerations have to be considered when you put in place a a training program. And I know this is a mistake that a lot of trainers will do. They'll, when they're putting together a program for people, it'll be one size fits all. They'll take the 50 year old accountant and give them the same strength and conditioning program that you would give a professional athlete, which is, and the logic makes sense, right? Why not give people the best possible program. But the reality is, if it's not a good fit or if you're increasing risk in ways that they're not comfortable with, then it just isn't something that they're likely to stick with or it could have weird side effects, right? I mean, in the case of jujitsu, if you go in too hard before you're ready and you start getting injuries, man, if you need your body to do your work, if you're a, you know, if you have a job that is somewhat physical, you could be impacting your career if you don't train safely. So 
I feel like those constraints are very important to understand when you're setting up a program. And I'd love to dig into how you do that. Great. Wow. You hit on such great points. And the first thing that I'll say is remember celebrities, the only difference between celebrities and us is that people know their names. That's it. You know, they they probably have a healthier paycheck too. But the point is <laughs> that they're human beings. That's the bottom line. So their bodies work functionally the same as ours do. And I know we see people like you mentioned, The Rock and some other folks that you look at them on screen and go, damn, so-and-so is in great shape and must work hard. Well, yeah, it's part of their job. It's part of their career. And if they don't maintain that status and that physical appearance, they'll lose work. So, you know, again, they're celebrities and you know their names, but we can all have those same type of bodies if we're willing to put in the work and put in the effort and also eat right. Nutrition is a big part of it. So the one thing that celebrities a lot of times do have that's a little bit different from us is a lot of them get paid to stay in shape. If they have to get ready for a movie, you know, the production company may hire a trainer to to stay with that celebrity and travel with them while they're getting ready and to wake them up at five o'clock in the morning and you go do your first workout of the day and then you go do another one in the afternoon and you also have a chef and doing all these things for you. So yes, there are some things, some luxuries that they may be able to afford both financially and time-wise that, that the normal people don't. But again, going back to as far as the way the human body works, theirs work just like ours. So looking at those bodies, we can get there. It's just, it may be a bit of a different path. So, you know, when I'm working with a celebrity, the first thing I try to do, and I actually, let me, let me start that over. When I'm working with anybody, the first thing I try to do is I say, where do you want to go? Right. Why, why are you here? What are your, what are the results you're trying to attain? What is kind of the end game? And for a lot of people, the answer is, I don't know. I just want to feel better. Okay. Well, let's break that down a little bit. So I know you say you don't know. Okay. Well, what if you did know? Then what would you tell me? Okay. Well, you know, I want to, I want to feel better just in my normal daily life. I want to be a little bit more flexible. I want to be able to bend down and touch my toes. I want to be able to just get down on the floor and play with my kids or my grandkids or whatever it is and not have to worry about hurting something when I go to stand back up. I have a lot of those people. And, you know, then you get to other people that are like, well, and actually had this happen with one of my clients. She called me, this is going back several years. She called me on Thanksgiving day. I was in Texas with my family and she was in Alabama. She calls me on Thanksgiving day and she says, Hey, I said, how you doing? She said, well, I just got a call from people magazine and uh, they want me to be on the cover. I said, Hey, that's awesome. And she had just had her second kid and she said, well, we got to go to work. And I said, okay, you let me know when she said, here's the other thing. I've got to be in a bikini. Okay, great. So for me, I look at that and, and I see excitement. I see a challenge. For her, she's terrified. She literally just had her second kid. She's got People Magazine reaching out and saying, we want to document you getting in shape. <laughs> and then we want to put you in a bikini on the cover of People Magazine. So we, we start looking at it from two very different standpoints right away. So my goal is to get her to the other side of fear. And remember, fear and excitement, chemically, it's the same emotion in your body. It's processed the same. It's just how you interpret it. <laughs> so I tried to let her know, look, this is an opportunity. I know you're seeing it as fearful and you don't know how you're going to do it. I'm here to tell you that you got me. I'm right here by your side and you and I are going to do it together. So once we get to that place and she starts getting excited about the process, we start putting a plan together. How many days are you available? I mean, you know, she's also doing other shoots and things at that time. So, okay, well, I can do this time and this time only a couple days a week. Okay, well, then I'm going to have to put a program together for you on these days that you're you're on set from you know morning till night. Then you got to go home to your kids. I'm going to put a program together that you have to do at home. This is going to be part of it. Are you willing to do that? Yes. Great. So, you know, it, it's going to be different for everybody. There's going to be a different approach and a different method. Going back to injuries that you were talking about, it's huge. That's the part that sits with me sometimes that I'm like, okay, I work with a lot of these people that are athletes and dancers, and if they get injured, that's their livelihood. And that's going to come back and you know, be, be a big black mark on my record real fast too. When it comes up on Extra or Entertainment Tonight, that so and so working out with trainer Mark Herrera got injured, and you know they just <laughs> lost their movie, or you know won't be dancing this season on Dance with the Stars, or whatever it is. There's some pressure there, so I have to push and I have to get 100 percent out of them so that they're making changes and they're seeing the results and, and feeling how they want to feel. But I got to be careful not to go a little bit too far and injure them 
because that's going to be bad for both of us, especially them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very relatable thing. I mean, it's funny because like I don't know about in your area, but I can tell you with professional jujitsu athletes, these people are crazy, at least by any reasonable (laughs) standard, just in terms of the dedication and drive that they have. I mean, when they say they want to be a pro athlete, they're literally they're they're living and dying for this martial art and they're doing nothing else. They're just they're training all the time. There is a, a famous story. There's a famous uh, jujitsu athlete named Neil Melanson and his toe got all screwed up. He got it injured somehow. And the doctor said, OK, look, to, to get your toe back to the point where it's going to be back to 100 percent, we're going to need to put you on this rehab plan. You're going to need surgery. It's going to take about a year. And he said, just cut it off. Because he figured he would rather lose his toe than lose the time training. Uh, That was how important the martial art is. So he's missing a toe because he just decided, you know what? It would take too long for it to heal properly. So I would rather have the time on the mats training than have my toe. That is to any rational person. That sounds absolutely nuts. But that's because for most of us, we don't dedicate our lives to something like a martial art like this. So, yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on how you deal with people who have different kind of scales of intensity like that. You know, in, in that field, and I've got a background in Krav Maga, and we can talk about that in a little bit. So it's a little bit different from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but it does incorporate some of that. I see that. And especially with fighters and athletes, remember, their window of time that they can profit off of their bodies is so limited not just by age, but also you never know when you're going to step in the ring and something's going to get snapped. And that may be the end. So when you've got somebody that basically says, okay, I can either spend a year doing rehab or you can just cut the darn thing off and I'll learn how to work around it. There's an athlete's mentality that a lot of people will never be able to see or understand. And to a lot of us, the idea that sounds nuts. You're going to, you're going to lose your toe and that's going to be gone for the rest of your life. Yeah. Okay, but I get it. This is what you're trained for. The mentality is almost like military in that sense. And let me, let me, before I make that statement, let me say I have never done military work. That's one thing that I, I wish I had done in my past. So if anybody out there is listening going, you don't know, bro, you're right. And number one, <laughs> thank you for your service. And I have nothing but respect for you. But just going from a mindset, that's, that's really what it is. I mean, you know, you go into military, you're, you're trained to kill. Like you're trained to go in there and do a certain job. It's the same kind of thing as an athlete. You're not going in there to kill, but you are going in there to, to fight for your teammates and go get that win, whatever it takes. You're willing to sacrifice your body. Look at some of these athletes that are out there that go in full force every single day, never knowing if the next snap of the football is going to be their last or, you know, if the next layup they go up for, they're going to come down and it's going to be their last time they jump up. There's a lot of risk involved. And so while they have the ability to use their bodies to make this money, this is their career, this is their life, and even more than just the financial aspect, it's their passion and it's what they want to do. So if losing a toe means I get to do what I want to do, I do it. Yeah. When you phrase it like that, it it makes a lot more sense. And you can kind of understand how, man, this is, you know, to some people, they might not share the same passion, but that drive is something that people can relate to. And I think if you are a professional athlete, it's also hard because when you're a professional athlete, you have to really be in like the top 1% to be successful. That's Mm -hmm. not the case with other careers. I mean, you can, if you're, if you're a tradesperson, you want to be good, but you don't have to be the top 1% in the world in order to get a paycheck. Whereas for athletes, totally different story, right? So I totally get the intensity and also the time window because yeah, I mean, the thought of having to basically tie up your career and wrap it at 30 to 40, that's very different from what someone who works at a desk is going to experience where they have a longer window. Yeah. And you're exactly right with what you're saying. And you know, that gets into a whole money conversation with sports and that, that could be a whole nother show in itself. But you know, you've got to understand these people, they do have a very limited time to do what they do. And even the most elite of athletes, they're probably done with their, with their playing careers by early mid thirties. They're at least starting to see the decline. I know everybody's brain always goes to, Oh yeah. Well, what about, you know, Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers? Okay. There's going to be some unicorns out there, of course. But you know, what's the average lifespan in the NBA and the NFL? I think it's less than three years, right? So everybody always thinks about these, you know, the top paid athletes that are making millions and millions of dollars. Well, yes, you've also got your top paid actors, dancers, models, the elite that are being paid millions and millions of dollars. But there are a ton of others, the ones that make up the majority of the leagues. 
that aren't being paid that kind of money and that may only have a year or two on a roster and then they're done. Not only are they done making money in that sport, they're done with what they thought they were going to do for quote unquote the rest of their lives or at least their career. So, you know, I get the mentality of it. I get going 100% and playing full out with everything you got. And if that means cutting off a toe, look, there's a difference between losing a toe and losing a leg. Yeah. So it's risk reward. And I think uh, you have to think about what the balance is. And if I do this, then that gets me back in the ring faster and I can continue being the lead athlete that I am. It's an interesting dilemma that I think you, you have to juggle, but it really just goes to illustrate that strength and conditioning is not the same for everyone. Everyone needs a different fitness routine because everyone has different goals. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I mean, for a lot of people, myself included, I mean, my, my job, my, my interest when it comes to strength and conditioning is simply to be in, in relatively good shape, right? I want to be able to do the things that I want to, that I enjoy. I want to be healthy. I mean, at, at this point, it's looking like we're all going to catch Omicron. When I inevitably get that, yep. I want it to be mild as opposed to really, really bad. And the best way to do that is to get vaccinated, which I've done, and stay in shape, which I'm trying mm -hmm. to do. And so for some people, <laughs> it's not about having six pack abs, right? For some people, right. it's about... I just want to be healthy. I just want to be in good shape, reasonably healthy. And that's going to require a, a probably a, an adjusted routine, because like you said, some people are going to have constraints. I mean, I can imagine if you are, for example, uh, you know, you're a you're a 50 year old mother of three. You've got a full time job. Your ability to to commit to something like this, it is going to be time boxed. And so that means you're going to have to manage your expectations about what you can do within that time. But you can still I mean, if you can afford to spend, you know, a few hours a week, you can still get pretty decent gains on a fitness routine. And I imagine that a big part of your struggle is probably figuring out based on the based on the constraints that you're given from your client, what you can or can't do in that window. Oh, 100 <laughs> percent. That's a big part of it. I've got some clients that literally train five, six days a week. I've got other clients that come in and say, well, I can come in once a week. What, what are my expectations? Like, well, <laughs> expectations are going to be based on what are you going to do the other six days and 23 hours a week that I'm not seeing you? Yeah. And, and let's design your expectations around that. Let's not have unrealistic expectations if you're telling me that you can only work out one hour a week with me. So I'm going to be careful what I say here. I never want somebody to come in and think, oh, well, I have a personal trainer or I'm taking this workout class, so I'm going to be in great shape in 30 days or two weeks mm -hmm. or 90 days. Or It's not about that. It's not about hiring a trainer. It's not about just showing up. It's about doing the work consistently over time. Small changes over time equal huge results. But where a lot of people get frustrated is they don't see those tiny little changes that are happening on a day-to-day -day and weekly basis because you see yourself in the mirror every single day. So yeah. some people get frustrated after a week or two and start thinking, when am I ever going to see changes? It's like, well, you got to understand that the body doesn't change overnight. Your body didn't gain weight overnight. That was because you remained sedentary for the last five years and didn't do any workout. You weren't really paying you know, too much attention to your eating. And then COVID happened. We were all landlocked and everything else. It took time for you to get in the shape that you are now. It's also going to take time to get you back to where you want to be or to get you to that place that you want to be. So patience is a big part of it and being consistent and trusting the process. And I know that's such a cliche, but man, it's true. <laughs> it, it really is about trusting the process and knowing that what you're doing on a daily basis is making those small changes. And if you will give me three months, if you will give me six months, if you'll give me a year and we do those side by side pictures and you look at day one versus day 30 or day 60 or, you know, month 12, you will see the changes. It's just hard to see small changes every single day. Yeah, it's one of those things, like you said, because you see your own body every day and it's also kind of hard to measure things like your endurance right. level. It's even surprisingly challenging to measure things like strength. So it's not like you have a little uh, progress bar that's just going up every single day, like in a video game, right? The the changes can be silent and they can also be uneven. Yep. This is something that we talk about a lot on, on our podcast in the context of jujitsu. People who come into jujitsu, they often have very, very specific result-based goals that they want. And usually it comes down to, I want to be a black belt mm -hmm. or I want to be a champion 
or some combination of the two, right? right? Everyone comes in and says that. And so they'll come in and they'll train and they might even really enjoy jujitsu, but eventually they're going to realize that on average to get a black belt in Brazilian jujitsu takes about 10 to 12 yep. years. It's a, an anomaly in terms of how martial arts work because most other martial arts, the black belt is awarded after like two to three years for whatever reason in jujitsu land. It's going to take you about 10 or 12. And a lot of people, when they realize that, man, this result I'm chasing is actually going to take me like a substantial part of my life. They just can't sustain the fire and they burn out and they leave. Yep. Similarly, for people who are chasing championships, they're, they might get so caught up in the idea of winning a tournament that if they fail to do it in their first go, mm -hmm. they get demoralized and they walk away or they, they go into a depression or something like that. And so much of that is because of an outsized focus that people have on the result. Like I want those six pack abs or I want the, 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 the black belt or the world championship. But what I always advocate for when I'm coaching people is what you really want to worship is not the result. You want to worship the process. You have to have quality habits that you enjoy doing that make you feel good. And what I suggest people do is don't even get too focused on measuring the results, measure the habits, Rather than looking in the mirror and saying, do I have six pack abs? Yes or no. And making a value judgment about that. Think about, did I get my workout done today? Did I go for a walk today? Did I eat healthy today? Just like small micro goals that you can build over. And you do that, you chase that long enough. And then one day you look in the mirror and you realize, ah, yeah, here we are. What do you know? <laughs> I don't, I don't feel, I'm not embarrassed anymore about going to the beach with my shirt off now. Amazing how that happened. I distinctly remember that happening to me when I started jujitsu and I started getting together with a trainer and I, I was always beating myself up because I just didn't look as good as I, I wanted to. And it just, I wasn't getting the result. And then one day I remember in the jujitsu change room, you know, I, I, I took my shirt off and everyone's like, whoa, Steve is jacked all of a sudden. And I thought, oh, geez, for, I, I didn't even notice it. Of course, then I had a kid and, you know, the pandemic happened and that I, I am trying to get back to that version of myself. <laughs> but And it's there. It's there. It, it's 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 still there. It's just under it's just <laughs> under a layer that I'm attempting to remove at the moment. But it's it's so important to not just chase the result, but to have habits that make you happy as well. And I found for me, that's been a the hack, right? If there is a hack, which is you don't want to have a diet that makes you miserable. You don't want to have a fitness routine that makes you miserable. It's about creating a routine that you love and enjoy, and you'd be happy to keep doing for the rest of your life. Oh yeah. It's also about living life along the way. There's a couple of points I want to hit based on some of the things that you just said, which were fantastic. Starting out with, like you said, everybody wants to be a black belt. Another great saying that I love is everybody wants to be a beast until it's time to do what beasts do. Same thing. Everyone wants to be a black belt until it's time to do what black belts do. Yep. And that's work their tails off. That's discipline. That's showing up. That's getting your butt kicked. That's getting thrown down to the floor and then getting back up repeatedly, not once, but over and over and over. It's hard. It's dedication. And there's a reason that everybody wants to be a black belt. There's a reason that everybody wants to be a Super Bowl champion. There's a reason that everybody wants the, you know, the ball in their hand in the bottom of the ninth in the World Series. Like there, there's glory in that. But you gotta chase the glory. Like you've got to, you've got to work. You gotta get through the crap to get to the glory. And there's a lot of crap along the way. You'll probably break things. I know, again, yeah. going back to, to Krav Maga, I've, you know, I'm a green belt in Krav Maga. I've made it black belt status yet. I'm still working on it. And uh, had a little bit of time off because of the, the pandemic as well. So I'm excited to get back in there. But it's something that's on my radar because, because I want it. And I've got to earn it. I've seen what people do and how long it takes to get there. And hopefully I can. I've had several setbacks along the way. I've had two broken thumbs. I got a concussion during my green belt test that I didn't even know about until two days later. Uh, that set me out for a while. But it's getting through those kind of things and then still having the heart and still having the desire and the passion to move forward because you want it that badly. And when you want something that badly, you'll get it. You just got to keep pushing for it. Yeah. One of the things that's really interesting too in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to kind of tie it back in, we're talking about strength and conditioning. And there is a little bit more of a measure for some of those kind of things. Like you can see the weights that you're lifting increasing. Um, you can time yourself on speed and things like that if you're running. Endurance can be measured. But when you're talking about martial arts and Brazilian jiu-jitsu and things like that, and, and for me personally to tie it back a little bit, one of the things I noticed when I was really getting into Krav Maga and doing it, you know, five and six days a week, 
is how much the speed and reaction time increased and what kind of strides I made. And I didn't realize it until something came up. If it was an injury or I had to be out of town for a while, I couldn't get back in or whatever it was. When I went back in on day one again, after being gone for a couple of weeks or a month, that's when I realized how much I had progressed because I lost a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah. And so it's measurable, but not always, you know, by a stopwatch or by a weight or by a tape measure. It's easier to measure the losses than the gains, unfortunately. There you go. That's a much more succinct way to say it. So thank you for that. So, yeah, so. I, I remember I remember the exact same experience when my daughter was born. I took a substantial amount of time off mm -hmm. of jujitsu to help be at home with the kid, right? And when I came back, I found myself in this awkward situation where mm -hmm. I knew what I needed to do, but I couldn't make my body do it fast enough. And it, it wasn't even like a, a muscle or a, a speed thing. It was just the muscle memory had kind of atrophied. I had to stop and think about what I was doing. I couldn't just do it because it had been so long that I, I kind of lost that ability to go on autopilot. And it, it comes back real quick, right? It took about a month or two and I was sort of back on the bicycle. But it, I remember it being a very weird experience yep. where I know what I want to do. I just can't do it. Like, I'm just too slow. There's like a fog in front of my brain because I've just been away for it for a while. And it is hard to measure those gains. But yeah, unfortunately, it seems a lot easier to measure the losses. It is. And that's that's also where a lot of people quit after they've been so successful and making great progress and they stop for a little bit, whether it's because of a kid or a pandemic or, a, you know, broken whatever. Then they go back in and they feel like, oh, my gosh, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can. You, you, you couldn't do it before either, but then you built up to being able to do it. You, you earned that. You worked for it and you got it. And now you can do it again. You can do it the same way. And most likely it'll take you a third of the time that it did the first time. You just didn't realize it because you felt like you're learning something new and making progress every time you walked in the door. And now you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I just lost it all. No, it's, it's still there. You just got to rebuild it again. And you have to have that patience with yourself and not get frustrated and don't quit. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. The secret is in not giving up. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like our natural inclination towards loss aversion is kind of a big part of the reason why people often when something goes awry, when they have a setback, it's so easy to just quit and not come back because it is hard to face your losses. It's hard to come back to something and realize I am three steps behind where I used to be. And it can be incredibly demoralizing, especially if you worked really, really hard to get there. So, yeah, I feel like when when those setbacks happen, that's when you run the risk of losing your, your of losing people. Right. We see this in jujitsu where, man, if someone gets a bad injury or if a life circumstance happens and they can't train, there's a good chance you just might not see that person again. And so that's. Part of the reason why I think, you know, chasing the result can be kind of dangerous. It's it's better to look at every day as a small opportunity to make incremental gains, because, yeah, if, if you're comparing yourself to past performance before you had a setback, you're always going to disappoint yourself. And that's not a good way, I think, to, to look at a, an ongoing process of improvement. That'll put you into a depression really quickly when you start thinking, well, I was on top before and I was making progress every single day and I, it was measurable and I could see it and I could feel it. And then, like you said, you had a setback and a setback when you break it down is it's the setup for a comeback. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to look at it in that way. And again, it goes back, goes back to the first thing we talked about with mindset is you can think of a setback as, well, I'm done. Or you can think about it as, okay, a setback. It's setting me up for my comeback and my comeback is going to be better and stronger because the one thing you didn't lose is the knowledge and experience that you gained all the way up the ladder to begin with. So physically, you may have been set back. You may be a little bit slower. You may be not quite as strong or not quite as fast, but you still have the knowledge and experience. Oh, and by the way, during that setback, you got more experience for whatever re the reason was that you, that you were set back. If it was an injury or whatever it is, you realize like, okay, well, I won't do that next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got to make sure. I remember one of the times that I broke my thumb, one of the times is awful. One of the times that I broke my thumb, we were doing, we were doing gun defense, long gun defense. And, you know, when we're practicing, we've got the fake guns and stuff like that. And they specifically said, don't, when you're holding the, the barrel of the gun, don't like wrap your hand around it. Cause when we go to, Oh yes. Even I know this and I've never trained craft. It, there's two ways that you can turn the gun or the knife, right? Well, the gun, especially yep. one way is going to twist your thumb off. The other way is not. <laughs> Right. I did it the first way. So, so, <laughs> and it was just one of those things. I had done gun defense several times, but it was one of those moments where I don't know if my brain wasn't in it or what it was, but that one time I did it and 
that set me out for about two and a half months. Jeez. And it's horribly frustrating because then you get back in and you don't have that quick reaction time and everything like that. But I did have knowledge. Mm-hmm. And you can bet your ass I haven't made that mistake again since. Yeah. I've made other mistakes, but <laughs> but I haven't made that one again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it feels like whether you're talking about strength and conditioning or really any sort of long-term goal – it sounds like the key is just having a process that you can always come back to and and that you don't derail from that process and that you kind of roll with the punches and take the losses because there will be losses, right? There's always yes. going to be something that happens that's going to pull you off of the routine. It's just, I think over the long term, it's about finding the way to get yourself back on the bicycle when that happens. I remember, like I said earlier, when my daughter was born, I took some time off of jujitsu. And I remember also at the time really kind of struggling with where I felt I fit in in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I was really close to getting my black belt, but I remember kind of having like a an existential crisis of doubt where I just didn't feel like I, I should. And I remember being really intimidated and ultimately I lost my drive to do it. But then at some point, I kind of came to my senses and thought, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to go back and have fun. I'm not going to worry about how good or bad I am or whether I deserve anything. I'm just going to get back to enjoying the thing that I used to enjoy at the beginning Mm -hmm. and not worry so much about all of these stupid labels attached to it and, you know, whether I deserve this belt or whatever. I'm just going to have fun. And I immediately, not only did it make it a lot easier to come back and commit to the routine, but I also got way better a lot faster for reasons I still don't quite totally understand just having a healthy mindset actually helped me learn as well i just enjoyed the time i was putting in more and i think i just absorbed things a lot more than i I had in the past and interestingly when covid happened i mean there were a lot of people who this was their first big time that they had to stop training and they really struggled with it whereas i didn't find it that hard because i had already taken a big layoff when my daughter was born and so i'd known hey i've been through this before I know what it's like to have to step away from this activity I love because other things came up and I know that I can get back on the bicycle when the time comes because I've done that before. And so the fact that I'd actually failed before, I guess you could describe it as a failure, the fact that I'd had to step away and I had succeeded at coming back and getting better, it gave me the confidence to do it again. And so it wasn't as scary the next time something happened. So one of the nice things about having a setback is it teaches you how to overcome setbacks and it teaches you that you can overcome those setbacks. Yes. And that goes back to what we were talking about before. You gain knowledge and experience through that setback. You gain the knowledge and experience that you can come back and you can start over and you know the process and you, because you trust the process and not only trust the process, but you trust yourself in the process that you won't make the same mistakes again that you did before. I say mistakes again, that kind of going back to myself with the injury, <laughs> COVID, you can't really write off to, as a mistake. It's it's one of those incidents that- Yeah, it's, it, mistake is maybe not the best word because it's not necessarily right. your fault. It could just be a setback for any reason, right? It could be you get hit by a truck on the way home, right? There's a million things that could happen that are not your fault that could pull you off course. Right. And it's just maintaining that knowledge and confidence in yourself that that you've done it before and you can do it again. And yes, you might be starting from a little bit of a different level, but it's going to be- quite a few levels above from where you started originally. And so do you want to let everything that you've built up over, you know, that period of time getting to where you were, do you throw that all out the window because of a little setback? And if so, I mean, that that's a choice you're going to make, but you're always going to have regrets. I I would feel anyways, versus going back, going at at maybe a bit of a different pace. And then when you feel comfortable, you can start to excel again just a little bit and you start ramping up, but you will get back to where you were before. And I think you will usually surpass that point very quickly because again, entering from a different mindset with different knowledge and experience going behind you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me ask a question, Mark, something I'd love to explore here and I'd love to get your feedback on. We've talked about how for everyone, their routine and their process is going to be different. And a part of your job as a coach is to custom tailor that process so that it works for everyone. But I would be curious to know when it comes to this thing, when it comes to strength and conditioning, nutrition, or really just a general process of personal improvement, are there any, is there anything that is constant? I mean, is there anything that you would say, look, for all of my clients, if you want to get in shape, I will always recommend one, two, three, or is it so variable that there are no universal constants? And if there are universals, I'd love to know what are those? What are the things that everyone who's listening to this should drop everything and do right now, starting today? Show up. That's my number one. 
Honestly, nothing happens unless you're willing to show up. And I say willing to show up, then you got to take action and actually show up too. But I love variety. So for myself, it, look, if I'm, if I'm trying to get ready for something specific, if I have to do a magazine shoot or something like that or a photo shoot for myself, there are certain things that I know that work for me as far as nutrition, as far as exercise in a certain way that I'll train myself. And there's a process that I'll put myself through because I know it works. I've also tried several different things that didn't work so well for me. So I've learned over the years, okay, well, this works for me. Doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody else. However, if they don't show up, nothing is going to work. So my number one is always is always show up. So you can try different things, kind of going back to what I was going to start saying a second ago. I love variety in my workouts. Sometimes I'll go, I'll lift heavy. Sometimes I'll vary it up and I'll go light weights, lots of reps. When I'm back in and doing Krav, I will back off of the weights a little bit and because I really enjoy Krav and I'll, I'll make that my primary form of workout. And then I'll still lift like two or three days a week if I can. But the key is, and the one consistent with all of those things is showing up and doing something. And if you show up and you don't like what we do, and I've got clients that I've done this with before, mm-hmm. and I've told them from the very beginning, my job is to learn you, who you are, what you like, and how I can help get you to where you want to be. Because it's not about me. They, you know, they're not showing up for me. They they may have heard my name or they may have heard I've worked with so-and-so. And so they think, okay, well, I'm going to train with him. But honestly, the reason they're showing up is for themselves, or at least that's where I need them to be. I need them to understand that why they're here is not about me. I'm not a magician. I'm here to help you to get you where you want to be. But the only way I can do that is if you show up and you do the work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's something that I have learned as I've had to start coaching people, which is I, I had always assumed that the job of a coach is to, you know, pull the magic levers and press the magic buttons that make your dreams come true. And that if you, if you get the right coach, they'll just tell you what to do. And then, you know, suddenly you're the, you have achieved your goal. Mm -hmm. But really in reality, a coach is just a facilitator. A, A coach, honestly, in a lot of cases, doesn't even really teach the subject a lot of things. They just help guide the subject. Yes. They facilitate the process. The coach is not a guru or a font of wisdom who can solve all of your problems. But what they can help do Mm -hmm. is help steer you in the right direction. But you've got to drive that car yourself. At the end of the day, a coach is a supporter. They're not the one who's going to pull you across the finish line, but they will help support you and point you in the right direction as you do it on your own. And that, that I think is a mistake that a lot of people have with coaches, which is they think that, hey, if I just get the right coach, all of my problems are going to weigh, or go away. You see this sometimes in the martial arts where there will be like a basically a, a very, very famous coach and people think, mm-hmm. man, if I just trained under that guy, I would be a world champion. Right. And you know what? It often doesn't wind up that way, right? It's not just about having the magic coach. Ultimately, you have to do the work yourself. Absolutely. There's, there's nobody that's going to do it for you. I can, it's the whole idea of, you know, lead you to water, but you have to, you have to drink it yourself. And it's, it's so true. And I see this a lot of times in class, but also we have a great community with Supernatural, with the, with the virtual reality workout that we do. And the people that interact with each other is, it's so inspiring to me. And one of the things that I always try to make sure that they understand, because they post up some wonderful things like, Coach Mark, great workout today. I got, or you got me to a hundred thousand points, or you got me this, or I've lost, you know, 12 pounds and six inches because of you. And the first thing I always say is number one, congratulations. Number two, thank you for the acknowledgement, but now I need you to acknowledge that you were the one that did it. I may have been the voice in the headset, but I'm the voice in the headset for however many thousands of people want to click on that button and listen to it. But the fact that you did it and you leveled up and you busted your butt and you got everything out of that workout that you possibly could, that's a you thing. And I want you to be proud of the work that you put in. So thank you for acknowledging me. I appreciate that. But thank yourself more than anything else, because you could have clicked the button, put the headset down in the other room and let it play. Nothing would have changed. So, you know, give yourself the credit for working hard. I also do that in class too. When people come up after the class, I always ask, you know, well, who hit a, who hit a new record today on the treadmill? And people raise their hands all the time and I love it. And I, I try to tell them from the, from moment number one, look, this is 100% about you. You made the choice to do it. I am never going to be the person that stands behind you and screams at you and makes you do it out of fear. That's not going to get you anywhere. I want you to do it because you've got the confidence in yourself. And that also means that you are going to be there to receive the reward too. Because if I'm there screaming at you, then I kind of made you do it. 
but you ain't doing it for me. You showed up and you're here for you to get you better and for you to have the confidence that you can do this without me. And that, that's what's most important to me is for people to understand how strong that they truly are and to have those victories for themselves and to feel comfortable celebrating those victories and acceptance is, is such a huge thing. Yeah. Amazing, man. Well, I, that's a lot of cool stuff to digest. That was super helpful for me. I guess I would ask, Mark, before we tie this up, any final thoughts, closing thoughts that we didn't get to today that you want to share? Oh, gosh. I mean, we can go on for hours. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, hey, I just, I really appreciate you reaching out. I know, you know, when you and I first talked, kind of started with a, do you have a background in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? And my first response was, you know, I'm always going to be honest and say, no, you know, Krav Maga crosses some planes and we do involve Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but I'm certainly not going to go in and be like, all right, Steve, let's go roll. You'll kill me. So, so <laughs> but, you know, but I, what I do is a huge part of, of training and whether it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Krav or boxing or gymnastics or, or dance or swimming or whatever it is, strength and conditioning has such a huge role in whether it's physical activity that you're trying to excel in or just life in general. And so I want to say thank you to you and to your community for, you know, for, for reaching out and for, for listening and for um, the acceptance and understanding that even though what you do is amazing to me. And I would actually love to be more a part of, of that community as well and learn from you guys. I appreciate you you know, allowing me to come into your community and talk about some things that are important that hopefully we can help each other. And hopefully the understanding of some of what I do with strength and conditioning and resistance training and stretching and flexibility and all that stuff will hopefully make you better in what you're trying to do as well. It all works together. Absolutely. Thank you so much as well. And I greatly appreciate it. I mean, I'm I'm certainly happy to have you on because I know one of the limitations that we have in the jujitsu community is that it is very kind of insular and we go to ourselves for answers a lot of the time. So what you'll find is mm -hmm. much of the time, if you go and you talk to jujitsu people about strength and conditioning, they will either have, you know, put together a routine themselves that works for them, or they will have consulted with maybe some someone who is not really a strength and conditioning coach, but they're, you know, they were able to kind of put it together on their own. Jiu-Jitsu people are very kind of stubborn in that way. They like to put together things on their own. And part of what I want to do is make sure we always bring in the, the best experts from outside of our community so that we're not just trying to, you know, brute force or reinvent problems that have already been solved. A lot of the athletes that I know who train professionally, they don't even really have a strength and conditioning program. Their strength and conditioning program is just train for 10 yeah. hours a day and just by virtue just by virtue of the <laughs> clock time that they put in they're in great shape but there isn't really a lot of intelligence behind it so i always love engaging people at the conceptual level because this is the kind of stuff that i'm not sure that we get in the community and yeah if i mean if anyone is of course looking for a coach that is engaged in this kind of thing i mean now now you're in front of them i would ask if people want to follow you or get in touch with you mark how do they go about doing that Sure. You can reach me through Instagram. My Instagram handle is Mark Pulse. It's M-A-R-K. P as in Paul, U-L-S-E. Pulse like heart rate. My fitness studio in Sherman Oaks is Pulse Fitness Studio. So Mark Pulse. And then you can also go to my website. It's just MarkHarari.com. H-A-R-A-R-I.com. And then you can reach me through there and um, got some training programs on there. Just if you want to reach out and have a chat, if I can be of any help, I would be happy to do that. And I, I love what you said. In, about incorporating some strength and conditioning. And I would, I would say if you don't do that with what you're doing with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, if that's, if that is your main thing right now and you're doing that five, six days a week, try to add some in, whether it's through me or through another program. You know, I'm not trying to sell myself here, but I'm, I'm trying to get you to step out of your comfort zone of what you do on a daily basis. You'll feel it differently. It'll affect your body differently. And you may and probably will realize that it really does help in a lot of other areas through balance, through strength, and it will up your game in what you do every single day. So don't be afraid to try something new, even if it's, you know, everybody else is like, nah, you don't want to do that because you'll, you'll lose flexibility. No, you won't. Yes. <laughs> if you're with the right coach, no, you won't. You get somebody that understands what you're doing, why you're trying to do it and, and what you want to get out of it, then you'll, you'll find the right coach that will, that will help you excel in the right direction for you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. And I'll put those links in the show notes if people want an easy way to reach out to you. Mark, thanks so much, man. I mean, like I said earlier, I got to confess, I haven't done my supernatural workout yet today, but I'm telling you, I will do it after I finish this recording. I will go do it. I'll go punch the balls. I'll go dodge the lasers. It's all going to be good. 
do it and you know I can find out on my end whether you, you have or not so <laughs> heads up <laughs> that, that's the best thing about this whole freaking thing there's like a built in accountability buddy system I get, I'm going to get harassed if I don't go do my exercise okay well thanks a lot Mark I greatly appreciate that and of course all of the listeners greatly appreciate your time as well of course I think everyone knows but we've got an awesome premium service if you want more deep dives into the kind of jujitsu concepts we talk about on the show or you want me to help you directly uh, review your rolling footage I'm happy to do so you can check that out at premium.bjjmentalmodels.com there's a free trial so no risk supports the show i really do appreciate everyone check that out premium.bjjmentalmodels.com mark again thank you so much for your time man i one of these days when this pandemic is over i'm gonna have to fly down meet you in person it would be my pleasure to strangle you with your pajamas (laughs) i'm not sure how i feel about that but i'm gonna say thank you anyways because you've been a pleasure and to your community thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of your lives for a little bit here and let me know if i can if i can help further no worries and of course to everyone out there who hangs out with us every week greatly appreciate it and we'll talk to you guys next time 